Hi everybody, I hope you're doing marvellously well. In today's episode, I'm going to talk a little bit more about this. So a few weeks ago now, I think actually it's coming on five, nearly six weeks, I slipped over while trying to perform some acrobatics. No, <laughs> in all seriousness, I was being really foolish. I was carrying my laptop with my phone balanced on it, and I stood up and tried to avoid my dog and slipped and fell. And being the idiot I am, I worried more about the laptop than I did about my left hand. So I put my left hand out when I fell. I fractured my wrist and probably worse, to be quite frank, is I tore some ligaments in here. I had the MRI about a week ago, and I go back to the specialist in a few days, so I'll know a bit more. But as you can tell, obviously, it has severely changed my daily routine. I used to play guitar all the time. I used to do videos, one or two a week at least, where I played guitar in them. So it's been it's been an adjustment. It's been difficult for me because, of course, I'm a guitar player first. I still played, up until recently, several hours a day, every day. I'd answer emails playing guitar. I would make videos as a guitar player, you know, you name it. So it's been a huge adjustment. We're good friends with Julia Hofer. Julia Hofer has Julia's bass lab, and she has a show on Toman. Toman's channel, which is very successful. She's an incredibly good bass player. She's a great educator and just really cool person. We met Julia about, well, it'd be three years ago now in May in Bavaria in, in Germany. And about two weeks after we left Bavaria and came back to Los Angeles, Julia broke her hand. And it was quite severe. She actually had some metal put in there. She'll tell you all about it. So I wanted this great opportunity to talk to another musician who has been through this, and also just an excuse to introduce you to Julia, because she's a wonderful musician, a great educator. You should check out her stuff, and you will probably already know her because she's in our Le Freak video, our chic Le Freak video. So without further ado, let's start talking to Julia. Thanks ever so much for doing Le Freak. Bernard Edwards is one of my favorite bass players ever. Oh, he's awesome. And I love his sound. So yeah. uh, first of all, I didn't realize um, because he's playing music band with Threadbounds. And it was so, of course, first of all, when you go back, there were just flat wounds, strings, and then round wounds. And so it was really um, common to play with flat wounds. But nowadays, with playing a music band with flat wounds, that yeah. was really unusual yep. to me and it was so cool i just love the bass lines they're so punchy yeah and so with so much energy well i mean he was he co-wrote those songs he also co-produced yeah. them i mean he was ridiculously talented also it sometimes it sounds easy because you have got patterns for a really long time but you have to play so much into in in the pocket and also when you switch the parts it has to be on point and really tight. So sometimes it sounds easy, but it's not actually. It's really hard to nail that. Yeah, that bridge, the boom, ba dum, da boom, ba boom, ba dum. That uh -huh. part is deceptively simple. I play with a lot of bass players who couldn't like just hold it down because it when when you switch, it can't feel like it switches. Yeah, the problem is with that line that um, you're playing this with the open A and D string and you have to be sure to mute the A string, the open A string, because otherwise it would ring into the whole pattern and it would sound awful. So you have to have a good muting technique and also how he's playing it, because sometimes he's playing a lot of really short notes um, from tone length, so you have to be sure to to get this done. So it isn't that easy. What other bass players kind of inspired you to play bass? The first inspiration was Marcus Miller and Tall Wilkenfeld. So Tall Wilkenfeld, the album, and also when she played with Jeff, Jeff Beck and Vinnie Cola Yuda, it was like, I want to do exactly what she's doing. Pino Palladino is on my list really really high. i adore him the most he's done so many different uh, things from 
jazzy to really rocky and smooth. Wow. R&B, sure. my favorite song of last year. I get to know a Batman's song, Tears for Fears. I've never heard this before. And I just, I, I don't know, I think in October or something like that, I I just heard the song for the first time. Wow. And there's Pino Palladino on bass and Manu Kochi, I think, on drums. And that blew my mind in, in the verse. How he, how tasteful he's playing the bass line. Not very much, but bass, the bass and the bass drum together. I don't know. That's a world, a world going on. Wow. I have no words for that. Started off with Paul Young and yeah. played one uh-huh. of the most famous sort of fretless lines. You know, yes. do, do, do. Yeah, yeah. Like my head. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, of course, in the 90s, he became D'Angelo's bass player. And then, of course, you know, John Mayer, I mean, The Who. I mean, yeah, he's exactly. insanely eclectic. He's played with everybody and everything. One of the things I want to talk to you about, of course, because we were talking about it online, is hand injuries. Yeah. So did you did you get injured skiing, I think, is where I'm going to go? <laughs> no, I was a gymnast first when I was really young. And when I was like, I think it was... 23 or 24 then I also did like back flicks flips and stuff like that and I did it with a friend of mine and he slipped and I slipped (laughs) and that's it and my wrist was broken oh left hand it was not a good time did you tear the ligaments as well yes yes that's the worst thing isn't it yeah. Yes. Ligaments and I also had like to do surgery. Oh. So like I had a plate in it for one year and I got it out last summer. So were you <laughs> able to play at all? I wanted to play as soon as possible because yeah. there was so much going on. I played my first gig three weeks after my surgery. Everything just with my index finger. So I checked all the songs out just with my index finger on the E and the A string. (laughs) Wow. This wasn't a good idea, actually, because it took a long time till everything was really, really good. So almost a year or a year and a half. Wow. Really, really long. So I think it wasn't a good idea to get back so soon but I just wanted to play and everything was running really well and I just wanted to practice and to get better and it was like a punch in my face <laughs> at that time. What did you do because I today I just picked up the guitar for the first time in oh, the really? longest and, and mm-hmm. I realized that you know the first thing I noticed my fingers are still you know working well but uh-huh. the um I didn't do any stretch exercises. Obviously, I don't want to do anything crazy like that. Did you lose the calluses on your fingers, on your fingertips? Yes, a little bit, but I think this wasn't was not a problem. Actually, I I had a pain in my wrist for a long time. I didn't have a lot of strength and and yeah. power to just play bass. So yeah. first of all, I started with the guitar because it was so much easier. Yeah. And then switch to the bass a little bit later. I learned to juggle at that time. Juggle? I think, yeah, I think that was a good exercise, actually, because I also had, like, physical therapy from the very beginning. And then I tried to juggle to just keep that fresh. So I did a lot of training then. And I also put my hand a lot into um, warm water with salt to get the movement in and that everything is flexible again. How long was it when you were allowed to like, were you able to start playing again? Mm, really start playing properly two months. Oh, well, that's not too bad. Yeah, that's not too bad, but it always hurt. Yeah. So for, I, I started two months, really play properly, but you always have the feeling in your head, oh, it will, it's going to hurt again because I started so early. I always had this pain memory in my head. So that wasn't really good. And every time I 
uh, I went to my instrument, I had this bad feeling. So that's also a point where starting later is so much better. And then it took me, I don't know, I always had like ups and downs. So ups where everything went very well and I said, yeah, I'm back. And then really downs where it hurts really much. Um, so after that, I really had to figure out how how much time I can spend with my instrument without hurting my hand. You really have to hear what your body is saying. Yeah, I'm a little terrified. Did, did you keep the um, the splint on when you were playing? At first I did, and I also had like tapes. So I taped my hand a lot at the beginning. So the the I think the f- half a year, like six months every time, like wow. with tape, then it was okay. But I presume you couldn't you couldn't do particularly big stretches because I find if I try uh, I try to do a stretch it really hurts. So I'm I, I yeah. What I've been doing is I've just been gently just just going you know da uh-huh. da, 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 da just keeping <laughs> just playing like chromatic on one string just to keep my yeah, fingers because yeah. I'm so afraid that if I stop playing entirely it will be like learning again. No, I don't think so. I think it will come back really quick. Of course, at the beginning, it will be very frustrated because, of course, it's not like at the beginning. What I learned in this whole process, how to play a song without playing it. So like reading notes. So that was really important for me because now I also use this tool. I'm sitting in the train and I'm just learning a song just by listening and memorize it in my head. So visualize it without playing it. That was a really cool tool I learned in that whole thing because I didn't want to play too much, but I had to learn the song for a gig, for example. So I had to memorize it without actually playing it. Did you find that you were practicing a lot of right-hand technique stuff? Yes, I practiced a lot of right-hand technique stuff (laughs) because this was all I could do. But with the time, it gets a little boring because you want to play something else. But I did a lot of uh, right hand technique and also uh, because I play cello, like bow technique and stuff like that. So and I also um, started to play like synth bass. So this was the, the, the time where I thought, OK, you have to learn something new. And it was super cool because everything with the right hand. Uh, so this was the time to get started with the synth, synth bass. So yeah. now people can hire you as a synth bass player. Uh, <laughs> not so much. Talking about the fact that, you know, from hand injuries, when you started to warm up, what what are sort of your warm-up exercises now? When you first pick up a bass, what do you warm up on? I don't warm up actually with the bass. So I do like um, hand exercises so that yeah. they are warm. So I have like something like that, that right. everything is stretched very well. And that my fingers are getting the temperature I need because right. also now when it's so cold outside, when I'm going, for example, to the theater to play, um, I do this like five minutes to stretching and get the right temperature. It's always different. Sometimes I start with normal finger exercises, like randomly finger exercises, Sometimes try it up and down. Every day is different with what right. I started. Yeah. Right. And sometimes also really slow for the for the right hand, and then starting to get faster and faster with the BPM. So it depends. Is there? You know, you started by playing cello. Is there any like cello exercises that you morphed over on into bass? Is there? A, Something hmm. that's kind of unique from a cellist perspective. I mean, we've got a lot of etudes. How, how do you call that? Etudes. Et- yeah. Etudes. So I'm doing this on bass too. That's that's that that's my warm up. That's like random, like for example Bach. Yeah. Or stuff like that. There's a lot of triads, a lot of uh, inversions. So that's uh, the the cello thing. We bass player don't do really often, but it's so necessary and so useful. So I think that's a good transition from cello to bass and also working on your sound very well 
while doing these exercises because a lot of people just play them like randomly hit the, r the right notes but i want that this is sounding good to me that's my normal warm-up yeah. uh, for every every scale and then all the inversions so that's my my main program most of the time with the metronome so that I know I'm in time and then just go up the fretboard and go down like with every fingering. So that's, that's it mainly. And do you also do like you're doing, so you're doing single notes, do you do da 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 I do it with uh, because Billy Sheen is playing with three fingers, mm -hmm. so he's also using that one. So I also try to do the exercise with all three to get this technique done maybe in five years or something like that. Right, right. <laughs> because it's really helpful when you just have one f more, and it really helps to to get this done. I was think of uh, Iron Maiden's bass player. With our fuddle, ah, fuddle, yeah, fuddle, yeah, fuddle, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah he yeah, plays with yeah. all three fingers to get that that sort of triplet feel. What is your main bass these days? Is it uh, is it a precision? It's my Sandberg. Uh, it's like a jazz bass. Right. And this was the bass I got when I when I did a video at Toman at the very beginning. They gave me the bass, and I just had it in my hands for like two minutes or something like that. And I never had this feeling before. And I knew this is my instrument. I I have it here. That's my main base where I play like everything. Here it is. Gorgeous. It's a Sandberg base. Sandberg. That's a company from Germany. I found them by accident, actually. I didn't know them before, just when I had this base. It's really, the cool thing is that it is really light and the body shape is a little bit smaller than on a Fender base. So I don't look so small <laughs> because most of the time people say that I, with a Fender bass, they have like a bigger shape or a bigger body and they say I'm so small. And with that bass, I don't look so small <laughs> and they're really light. So in my, my back don't hurt um, because when you're playing long for a long time, it doesn't hurt. That's really cool. Can I see the headstock? Yes. Oh, wow. it's called a. Was it called a California? Yeah, that's a California TT4, I think. Completely different sound. What is it you think that's unique about it? What is it you love about it? I don't know. I um, most of the time, um, I play with both pickups. When I have just the the neck pickup, it really sounds not okay, not uh, like P bass, but really, really similar. I didn't have that on any other like chess bass. So I really like this sound a lot. And also the, the bridge pickup, it's like Chaco. And I love the attack of the instrument. The handling is so smooth. So it's not a really big, it doesn't have a big neck because most of the P basses like have a really heavy neck. And that's too much for me. So that's really small and comfortable. You don't need a lot of power strength. Um, it's really easy to play. What gauge of strings are you using? I have uh, 45 to 105, my standard. When I was a kid, uh, all the guys were into slapping. So they'd have like a 30 or a 35, 30, 35 to like 85 or 90. It was pretty light so they could slap like crazy <laughs> <laughs> yeah i also know stanley clark also has like i think really light strings yeah really thin strings super thin yeah and what about your what about your bass amp setup what do you what do you, when you play live what do you use mostly rheingold that's like a german um company um i've got uh, rheingold amps and Aguilar. so these are my two um setups and i love my i don't know do you know gen spence yeah 
Yeah. yeah. And I think they are not existing anymore. So I have one of the last uh, Ginspens amps and I'm really happy about it. Also, the amp uh, is really light, which is important for me for when I'm playing a lot of gigs. So it's really easy to carry. It's like a 12 inch box with top amp. And th that's really cool. It's really taken off of Toman. I mean, you're, you're, you're like, Toman's most successful person now. <laughs> Let's be honest. <laughs> I never thought that this is, or I can't believe it also right now that so many people are watching my videos. I just love what I do. I just love music. And I think also breaking my head was like a chain game changer because there was a, a time where I couldn't play the instrument. And now when I can play something, it's such a great feeling. And I really appreciate that I can do wh what I do now. So I just, yeah, try to do what I love. And every time when I'm playing a new song, I'm really thankful that I could play this song more. And yeah, I just love it. Do you think they're going to do the, um, I suppose it depends on the pandemic. Do you think they're going to do uh, um, TGU this year in summer? I don't know. I don't even know if there are plans because I know last year there were plans, but it wasn't possible. And I don't know if something is planned to, uh, this year, but it was. It would be so awesome. Um, just, yeah, after such a long period meeting all of you again, it was such a good time. So let's see. Yeah, fingers crossed. It was a lot of fun. I, we we had an yeah. amazing time out there, and um, you know, especially going like going to Bamberg. It's just beautiful around there. Do you live? Where so, do you live? Do you live in Bamberg and then just commute? No, I live in Vienna actually. You only go in for events and stuff then. Yeah, I'm just going to Tomen for like two days a month, and oh wow, well. producing seven videos in two days, and then. Going back to Vienna. Well, six hours with the okay. train. Because in the train, I'm preparing also my stuff and I'm writing my script for the videos and checking out some stuff so I can work in the train. That's super cool. But now I also producing so much at home because it, it's not possible. It's super cool because we are going to get a new studio. So I'm really excited. For anybody that doesn't know Toman, it, it's... It, it's in a village and it's, I don't know, about half of the village is Toman, maybe more, yes? Yes, more. <laughs> more, yeah. And there's whole houses I, that are just where they film. I think there are like three or 400 people living there and every day there are like 1,200 uh, 1, people coming in and working there. So it's a lot. And then every time somebody wants to sell their house, I'm sure Toman buy it, yes? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> What's going on with 2022, music-wise? What is happening in 2022? Well, I'm hopefully shows coming back a little stronger, yeah. so that'd mm -hmm. be good. I, I feel like when all this happened, there was kind of a nice groundswell of people getting back into musicianship that's been yes. growing over the last five or ten years. I still think in pop music, like mainstream pop music, it's still dominated by electronic music, or at least, you know, music that's created, you know, more in the box, as it were. There's so much access now to great music that kids are coming up and they're finding music in all kinds of ways. Playlists now can be, you know, super pop, top 40, mixed in mm -hmm. with, you know, like classic, you know, Motown, like Marvin Gaye. Yeah. In the middle. And I like how eclectic kids are now, how they, they don't want to be pigeonholed to like one sound that they, they pride themselves in knowing and loving all kinds of music. It's it's really exciting. Yes. Well, what about you? Is there anything exciting you're, you're hearing that you mm, love? Different music. If something really like new pops out where you say, wow, I've never heard this before, something like that. I really like that people, I think, appreciate really much when you play live. Just uh the vibe and the feeling. I just love that when you have you as a band, for example, and then the audience, there's something in between uh, when you're playing and you can't transfer it uh, with 
a live stream or with, with a video. That's not possible. You have to be there to get that feeling which happening between all those people in this room. So I really like that this is appreciated much more, I think, than before. It's interesting you just said it because we, we were talking about a few minutes ago, talking about I went going to see Cirque du Soleil. And I, I sort of felt the same way because what I was watching with Cirque du Soleil was lots of people that were basically tumblers. You know, they were doing acrobatics, mm -hmm. gymnastics, as it were. And I, I, I said to, I said to my son, I was like, I was like, you know, kings and queens used to watch this, this exact same thing five or six hundred years ago. People performing. This was the pinnacle of humanity before we had special effects and lighting rigs and 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 laser shows and smoke and big screen and special all the special effects stuff. And when you're actually there experiencing, it, you're like, it's still unbelievable. It's still really amazing what human beings can do. So I know exactly yeah. what you're saying because you can go to see a show and you can see, wow, people actually play these instruments, not yeah. just the sample or the, you know, that I'm triggering or the, the virtual version of it. Yeah. It's, it, it still feels like the pinnacle of, of musicality of what we want. Yes, what we love. exactly. And also I like the thing that you just have to focus on one thing. All those people who are doing this, uh, at, I don't know, they really have to put work in there and really be concentrating on this and you can't do this overnight. So there has to be some passion in it. I, yes. I really love that. Yeah, I agree. I feel like that when, you know, what made some of these like, like, we talk about like Motown and jazz and, and those recordings. What made them so incredible was you hired like the best person for the job. And their only job, if you were Carol Kay, your only job was to play bass. Mm -hmm. So yeah. it's rather than the one guy who's going around playing all the instrument, you have like a producer musician brain on one instrument. Yeah. So once you've got 10 people in a room, you've got 10 of the best musicians in their field all working together. That's yeah. something that's can only be done that way. Yes, exactly. I also have like a new band right now where we're composing like really old school, sitting together in a room and composing together. So just two, three days locking in a room and writing all the songs together from the very start to the end. Are you and recording? It feels so great. Yeah, we're recording. We're just um, going to, we have ideas and we're recording that. And then at the end, we are going to do a proper recording with everything. But it's so cool to just write songs in a room, just with instruments and nothing else. And just people in room. So much fun. When are you going to make that record? I think in July. Most of the songs are going to be instrumental, but there are going to be two or maybe three songs on the album with vocals. Do you sing? Um, we want to hire Bruno Mars, but let's see if it's... <laughs> you want to hire Bruno Mars? Ah. <laughs> no, or Anderson Pack. No, no, no. Um, we, I don't know exactly um, what will happen. We're going to try something out. Let's see, if, yeah, what comes out. <laughs> Marvelous. Well, Julia, thank you ever so much. Yeah, thank you. It's been a lot of thank fun. Thank you. And it's been a lot of fun. yeah, I, I hope everything is healing very well. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, whenever I take the splint off, it's just weak. It's just so weak. Like, you know, even just like washing my hair, I'm like, ugh. Yeah, I know. Yeah, but the hand has to get used to it. When you take it off, it just needs some training. Yeah. It will take some time, but yeah. Fingers crossed. Yeah, fingers crossed, hopefully. All right. Well, thanks ever so much. Yeah, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. <laughs>